Thanks so much indeed. Thanks for the kind invitation to this great conference. We've already made friends with quantum computers in the keynote talks. So this is a short talk. And hence, there will only be a single crisp question in the focus of all this, but one that doesn't seem quite a detail, which is, oh, wait, great, but what do we actually do with quantum computers? So this is all about realizing a computer, a computer that could solve precisely the same questions or problems as a classical supercomputer. It can be little denying that computers have changed the world we live in. It could be the single invention of the last century that changed things most drastically. That said, ultimately, the world is quantum, not classical. So notions of computation, so what notions of computation emerge when using single quantum systems as carriers of information such as single ions, atoms, light quanta. So a quantum computer is just that, a computer with a classical input and a classical output, but in between one makes use of superposition and entanglement in a, in a clever way, exploiting structure when designing quantum algorithms. Now, attention about this idea is going through the roof these days, mostly for good reasons, I'm tempted to say. It's not entirely new though. It started off as um, rather conceptual investigations in the, in the 80s when Richard Feynman not only understood that it's a, a smart idea to use quantum systems when simulating other quantum systems than using classical computers, he already suggested ideas of polynomial reductions in a, in a pretty specific um, way. So when David Deutsch and Paul Benioff were playing around with quantum Turing machines, they were again motivated by deeply foundational considerations on computing. The splash came quite a lot later when the now famous Peter Shaw understood that there are practically interesting intractable problems for classical computers, hidden subgroup problems in technical terms, including factoring, that could break modern RSA crypto systems that can be solved on quantum computers in polynomial, that is reasonable time. He did so by deeply understanding what quantum computers are particularly good at, period, finally. So that's great, a, a, a tremendous wave of interest, mostly theoretical, and that is for a long time. Initial doubts that noise would necessarily hamper and, and, and bring down quantum computers could be settled with the in principle possibility of doing quantum error correction, which is a cute idea, given that one cannot just uh, measure quantum states and, and look what has been going on as this would alter, necessarily alter the encoded quantum information. And still, the quantum computer was mostly in our heads as, a, as an inspiring conceptual idea. Experimental progress was harder to come by and, and was related to serious efforts. In 2005, the first quantum byte could be presented here in a trapped ion system. And as recently as two years ago only, protagonists of um, Google, Rigetti, and IBM announced and presented data from 53 to 72 qubit superconducting computers. Around the same time, large scale photonic structures became available in Chenwei Pan's uh, group in, in, in China. And indeed, for paradigmatic sampling problems, in fact, for random circuit sampling, what is called a quantum advantage has been claimed of just solving some task on a quantum computer that is out of reach on a classical supercomputer. The upshot is that one can sample from the output distribution of such a machine and get a pretty flat, pretty boring, close to uniform distribution, but, but not quite. There, there's a funny tale and an interesting sampling up to a constant error in, in, in a certain sense is classically hard in a, in a very precise prescription. These are not very useful tasks still to be fair, but in, um, in, in its own right, the step was still a very significant achievement. It was actually, I was in Santa Barbara at the time when this came out visiting the Google AI and team and working with them. And it was really fun to see that literally every Uber driver and, and free shopping center newspaper would be talking about it. There's some technical fine print that spices up this development. 
For example, somewhat ironically, one cannot just black box verify those machines, meaning one cannot go into the lab and look at the data and judge from the data and the input to the algorithm alone to see whether this has all worked out or not. Okay, um, and then this experiment has also triggered a substantial um, effort, classical effort, a kind of race in the development of classical tensor network methods to simulate the experiment, something I'm happy to say more about later. These are interesting, very motivating first steps. But while well, the elephant in the room is the question, uh, great, but what are near-term quantum computers actually good for? And um, this is harder to answer and, and a question that keeps people quite busy these days, it seems fair to say. Now, realistic quantum circuits are noisy. They're expensive, they're precious, and they're short. For this reason, one commonly thinks of them as variational quantum circuits or algorithms, where there's a relatively small quantum circuit sitting there in the, in, in the center with various variation parameters. One measures the outcome and then runs a larger surrounding classical algorithm around it that makes use of the measurement outcomes and controls those parameters in an iterative fashion. The most direct application of such ideas is the variational quantum eigensolver, where one basically solves a variational principle over suitably parameterized sets of states. This makes a lot of sense. Think of some Hamiltonian, say, from the quantum chemistry context, and then one, one turns the knobs to, to minimize the expectation value, and one aims, in this sense, at approximating the, the true ground state. If the ansatz is expressive enough, there's some evidence that this can be done better than with classical variational algorithms. So it's a kind of quantum simulation, if you want, following Feynman's ideas. Of course, finding good control is an art form in its own right, but suitably sophisticated ansatz have the potential to contribute to solving problems in quantum chemistry. The quantum approximate optimization algorithm is basically a, a, a multi-round version thereof. It applies to problems in optimization where one hopes to better approximate hard to find solutions in combinatorical optimization problems as they are ubiquitous in the industrial context. Actually, and hard in worst case complexity for an exact solution in, in, in technical terms. So these are all reasonable and good applications. But there's a lot of fine print that still needs to be understood. And while there's enormous potential also for industrial applications, that is, the smoking gun of a provable advantage is, to be fair, still missing. A final application that is much moving into the center of things is to use quantum devices to assist in learning tasks. So specifically in unsupervised, supervised, or reinforcement learning. So again, given how ubiquitous machine learning has become, it makes a lot of sense to see whether quantum computers can help here. So the, the make or break question is, um, can we actually hope for a quantum advantage of some precise sort in learning? This can mean many things, of course. One may need fewer samples to learn. One could have a computational advantage, so one in computational complexity in there could be some quantum advantage after all. Now, a particularly clean setting is that of distribution learning or pedantically puck distribution learning. So here one is given a generator that takes random numbers and spits out samples from a distribution. Say pictures of forces, if you want. And the task of the learner is to find a generator that with high probability spits out samples from pretty much the same distribution as the original one. So the task is to learn a generator of this distribution, um, D. The one technical slide I have is, is this one on probably approximately correct learning, which is basically the same thing where one asks that the learner with probability of at least one minus delta, so probably um, um, finds a generator of a distribution D prime that is in, in, in the right sense close to the original distribution, so it's approximately um, correct. So 
is there a quantum advantage in computational complexity of this distribution learning task? For meaningful classical data and a simple oracle, basically, basically reading in classical data that one can, can, uh, can write on a, on, a, on a sheet of paper and even an exponential separation. And the answer is excitingly, yes, there is. Quantum computers can learn more efficiently. The proof is, is standing on the shoulders of giants. So the argument that the distributions are hard to learn from classically is based on the seminal work by, by Kearns. The quantum argument is um, in, in, in involved and under the hood of the reductions basically like it's, uh, it's basically the discrete log algorithm. So essentially one runs um, sure at the, at the it's, that's running here and, and under the hood. This is very encouraging indeed, but there is so there is a quantum advantage in meaningful learning tasks, but as such, it's not yet applicable to noisy intermediate scale or NISC um, schemes. And this seems to be the, the key question on the desk for the theorists of, of, of the field. So variational eigensolvers, quantum eigensolvers and quantum approximate optimization already provide evidence that those machines may provide solutions in quantum chemistry and, and optimization. This smells of industrial applications, no doubt about it, but there's a lot of fine print that's still missing. You need to understand how expressive these ansatzes are, how to do best classical control, what the classical complexities of doing control, how one can hope solutions to approximate the real thing and, and how can one prove it after all. That's um, these are all very important um, questions. Crucial in this quest, quest is also to be sure that one has done the right thing. So techniques of verification and benchmarking are important. So this picture here is a, is a heat map of the quality of the Sycamore chip used by the Google AI team for the quantum advantage using Hamiltonian learning where we have jointly walked the chip to benchmark the, the, the quality of parts of the chip with hilarious um, outcomes. There's also some evidence that the next steps into near-term quantum computing may even bring ideas of machine learning on the one hand, and benchmarking random measurements uh, on the other hand to, to look at that. Um, in that there are advantages in, in classical machine learning using quantum data. And this may even be the, the lowest hanging fruit after all. In particular, when we want to avoid um, the full monty of error correction and fault tolerance, which is still not quite decided whether this can be done or not in the first place. So this brings me to the end of the talk. So on the desk is the quest for finding industry relevant applications. The race is still open, it seems fair to say. And this can only work in a meaningful interdisciplinary effort where ideas of physics come together with those of computer science, of mathematics and with other fields. It's good to be excited. I'm, I'm extremely happy to work in this field and I feel very stimulated by these recent developments. At the same time, it's a good idea to be, good idea to be cautious and to, to, to moderate expectations a bit. There's also an element of hype involved that should be um, smoothly steered around. And in this context, I like to um, cite a friend and colleague from the Ulich Supercomputing um, Center who likes to say that um, quantum computing is exciting even if you restrict yourself to saying things that are true. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the questions you might possibly have.